Okay, we're back at the Integrated Rangeland Management class here at the University of Idaho. I'm Karen Launchbaugh, and um, we've just finished a, a lecture on different kinds of digestive systems, and now we're going to start talking specifically about herbivores. And again, I have with me Dr. Lisa Shipley. She's a wildlife ecologist over at Washington State University, and she knows a lot about herbivores because that's the things that she studies, deer, um, elk, rabbits, you, or pygmy rabbits. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so quite a lot of interesting research. So tell us a little bit more about these herbivores and, and the classification of those. Okay, sure. Um, let's just start where we started on the la last lecture. We really focus on digestive anatomy and body size and how that might influence what an animal can eat. So this time we'll look a little bit more about how those things and some, uh, some really subtleties in the digestive anatomy can influence the diet that a herbivore eats and its foraging strategy, which then again would affect their habitat requirements and what they can use. Yeah, and these are the things that we, we as wildlife biologists and range ecologists, we're often interested in those diets and their foraging mm -hmm. strategies and ha habitat requirements. So well, those will come up later when we start doing range management. So we know where those comes from, their digestive and body, and now these are the kind of where the rubber hits the road. Right, and I think these are important to think about and we think about groups of different kinds of herbivores on the same range. Okay. Line, so. All right, so, um, Sometimes we look at herbivores and put them on a continuum. I call it the browser grazer continuum. Some people put them in actual categories, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what's important to note is it's a continuum. There's no, you, it's, it's, it's a gradation between animals that eat what we're, I'm calling browse. And in this case, a lot of people think of browse as being a woody plant, but it can be a shrub, it could be a forb. Mostly we're talking about dicots. Um, and then the grazer eats monocots, so it could be sedges and mostly grass. And so, again, it's, it's, it's a continuum, but we usually say maybe 70% of the diet is browse or grass to put them on those categories. And then we certainly have animals in the middle, which are call intermediate feeder, so which can switch between the two, depending on the habitat, or often eat a mix of both. Okay. So they're sort of, again, the, the jack of all trades, and the others are sort of specializing on one type of plant or another. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but we typically see the browsers tend to be small and the grazers tend to be large. I wonder if Which you can think sense. of a, an example of something that's the opposite. Can you think of a small, small grazer and a large, large browser? Oh, okay, you'll have to correct me. I think of a lot, in Africa, there's little dick dicks and these little ruminants mm -hmm. that are, um, they're grazers, but they are very selective in what they eat. Maybe they're probably closer to browsers, aren't I they? Think, I think they tend to be browsers. Yeah, because of yeah. the, yeah, so no, I can't. And what about moose? Where do moose Moose fall? are, that's a great example. So moose are a very large browser. Oh, and okay. giraffes. Okay. So, so oh, they're, giraffes are, are yeah. Giraffes. So they kind of do not follow this pattern. Okay. So this okay. is not set fast. A, a very, very small grazer would be a vole which is a little oh, rodent, it eats okay, a lot okay. of grass. Okay. So anyway, okay. there are exceptions, but we're gonna talk about sort of uh, generalizations to help us think about this. So the reason that animals might specialize a bit on one type of plant or another is because they differ. And it sounds like you've already talked about plants, but- We have a little. We, yeah. we, we might remind you. So we're gonna talk about browses again, shrubs and forbs and grasses and talk about how they're different. And then we can see why we might have differences between them. So a couple things that we know is relatively speaking, Browses tend to have thinner cell walls. Uh, grasses tend to have thicker cell walls. So there's more fiber in grass that we have to think about fermentation and how long that's gonna take. However, within the cell wall, browses tend to have more lignin. And this is this completely indigestible material that makes things sort of woody. And so more of the, the cell wall is indigestible in a, in a browse, but there's less of it. Right, but um, in browses, they they put a lot of structural energy into the stems, mm. whereas in grasses, the difference between, say, a stem and a leaf right. is not as different as that's in right. the forbs. The forbs are very nice leaves and mm -hmm. stronger stems, so that a lot of that lignin is in the in exactly. stem. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly right. Mm. Um, the other, which I think we alluded to in the, in the last lecture, mm. is that browses, uh, dicots are really the, the main plant that has any kind of toxins, and they have a lot. Almost every poison you've ever heard of um, originally sort of came mm -hmm. from plants. So mm -hmm. phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, um, tannins, all of those kinds of things are in browses. Grasses really have very little of that. They can grow fun fungi that have it, but that's, or I guess they're not fungi, what are they? Um, the ergot. Oh, yeah, or, yeah that's is right. It, uh, yeah. it is a fungi. Okay. Oh, well, I'll, if, I'll correct that if not. But at, at any rate, the, um, the other thing we talked about earlier in class is uh, those phenolics and terpenes and other toxins are ways, mechanisms of, of avoidance, herbivore yep. avoidance. 
whereas the the grasses don't have those chemicals because they're they er, they tolerate herbivory. Mm -hmm. They just recover after herbivory. So it's a completely different strategies. But from an uh, herbivore standpoint, yeah, the those those terpenes and those phenolics can be pretty damaging uh, right. for those browsing animals. And so what you have to think about is if you're going to be a browser, you're going to have to be specialized, have some way to handle that because mm -hmm. um, now in grasses we also do have some silica, which in, especially if you're near a coastal area, and basically that's basically the the main problem with it is it can wear out the teeth and make mm -hmm, things a little mm -hmm. less digestible yeah. they're not toxic yeah right, right. Um, other differences are more structural and, and shape um, browses uh, we kind of say have kind of low to a high growth form if you're a forb you might be short but a lot of shrubs are really tall um, you might not be able to reach it I've seen pictures of goats getting up and oh, yeah, trying to do yeah. it right grasses even though we know there's tall grasses like reed canary grass most of them are fairly low um, low growth form which affects how uh, animals might eat them. Also, uh, I think this is where you're talking about the tolerance. Often the new growth for most browses occurs at the tips, so they're a little bit more sensitive to herbivory. Yeah, and they've got those thorns, that picture of yeah. the thorns, so they're yeah. avoiding, they, they yeah. avoid being eaten. Exactly, and they might have structural things like thorns, like you said, whereas eat grasses, mostly the new growth is added at the base, so it's protected from, mm -hmm. at least from, from mm -hmm. So they can recover, so they can tolerate grazing mm -hmm. better, yeah. And then, therefore, we have what I'm calling a more, di more diffuse architecture for browses, which means sort of um, spatially diffuse and branching architecture. Whereas grasses in general, if you think about a sward, are tend to be more compact and three-dimensional um, kind of architecture. Yeah, and that creates different uh, difficulties for animals harvesting them. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're just different approaches that you would use. Um, and, the, um, and then just even on a larger scale, generally speaking, shrubs are kind of patchy in nature, a shrub, a group of shrubs, whereas in general, grasses can be more uniformly across the landscape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? Certainly. So this affects how they forage for them. So um, in about the 1980s, a researcher um, Hoffman from Germany, he dissected a lot of animals <laughs> and he compared many aspects of their digestive systems and he tended to see differences in their digestive systems between the two. And we're gonna talk about those. I will have one caveat though. More recently, some researchers have tried to test some of the hypotheses about these benefits in live animals and haven't found as much distinction between browsers and grazers, mm -hmm. more about body size. And since browsers tend to be small, so these are important to, to think about, but this again is a generalization. Okay. Yeah, so I want to go back to an mm -hmm. error that I made. So these browsers like the little dick dicks. They, mm -hmm. They're browsers because they're using really high quality forbs, mm -hmm. right? Yes, because they're small mm -hmm. and they're following that strategy. Or they can eat the, the nutritious leaves off the right. browsers okay. too. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So as far as digesting food, um, the browsers and um, in some literature it's called concentrate selectors mm -hmm. and, and grazers are often called roughage feeders. Mm -hmm. You can you call whatever you want. I just like the browser grazers. I like that. Dichotomy. It's simple. Browsers, grazers, yeah. Yeah. Um, so because they're eating, have less cell wall, they uh, they don't need to spend as much time fermenting. So they have a smaller, simpler foregut compared to the roughage feeder. And more of the material passes into, out of the rumen, unfermented. So more of it gets into the true stomach. So they often have a larger true stomach as well. And they often have a larger cecum and hindgut because more of it escapes the rumen and can be digested there. So generalization. <clears throat> Some other differences inside the digestive tract. Um, the, the browser tends to have a larger reticular omasal orifice, which we talked about last time. It's that little constriction that's delaying the, the food. If you have a larger, you kind of look, the pictures are kind of showing you if you're looking down from the rumen into the- Eat Right into that orifice, yeah, right kind there of in that those. middle part. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so if it's a little bit larger, more, more rumen microbes and more material is gonna get into that true stomach. Yeah, that so you're, you're, ta you're talking about this orifice, right? The, uh, yeah, it's it very right good. Right there, and then on there. the other side, you can kind of see It'd the be, same thing. Yeah, I can try to find it my mouse. Or, oh, no, good no, good there. Okay, here we go, here we go. Right there. Okay, that good. is it. Yeah, that's okay, got it. it. Sorry, mm -hmm. not, not as good at the drawing as I could be. No, I don't know. <laughs> but you get, the, get, you get the idea. So, um, again, the browsers have a larger orifice. Why? So that because they don't have as much <clears throat> cellulose to digest and more of its lignin, which they can't digest anyway, it allows them to pass the food faster. More of the goodies can be then directly digested in the abomasum. And in, instead can, of being degraded by those microbes. Right. Okay, got Which it. is a little less efficient for mm -hmm. the, the good parts of it. And they can also um, pass food faster because they tend to be small, have a high metabolism. They can pass it through faster. They can eat and they, and they often eat higher quality food. Okay. Um, 
so they have less cellulose digestion because of this compared to the grazer, which is eating grass, lots of cellulose. They want to use it efficiently, so they're going to delay it and spend more time. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. The other things that are um, because uh, there's more cell solubles and less cell wall, the browser's going to be the, the microbes are fermenting their food really fast, and that's creating some acid and some really fast. Um, volatile fatty acids are being produced really fast. And so they need to absorb that really fast so that they don't cause trouble in their in their rumens. So if you look closely, you can see that the browser has all this papilla that looks like shag carpet, oh, and that yeah. increases the surface area for good absorption. Right. If you compare it to the yeah. grazer, it's kind of sparse, looks like an old carpet that needs replaced. Yeah, because they don't, they don't have to um, get all those, those high volatile fatty acids that would change the stomach. It's slower. It's yeah. just a slower process, so the small amount of Pilla can can handle it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the browser's gonna maybe eat chew more at first, but it's gonna spend less of their time chewing, chewing, rechewing to get it small enough to pass that really okay. small orifice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> also, as we said, that the browsers tend to have more toxins and things. That means that those browsers tend to have adaptations somewhat to deal with that. One place is most of uh, toxic toxins that you ingest are detoxified in the liver. We know this. Um, if you drink too much alcohol, you might damage your liver, yes, right? Because right. it's trying mm -hmm. to detoxify mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so there tends to be a, a trend that way. Also, a lot of um, browsers tend to have larger parotid salivary glands. And those are the ones that run behind your ear, down the side of your jaw. Those are highlighted in this picture. And you can see a concentrate selector or browser on the left. Um, the middle is the intermediate feeder and the grazer on, on the right. Um, and you can see they're a lot larger in those um, browsers. And there's a couple reasons. One, theoretically, they can produce more saliva, which helps buffer that high fermentation mm -hmm. rates okay. to keep them safer. Also, it helps them wash it through faster into the abomasum. And also, um, some of them produce these tannin binding proteins that take tannins that are produced by plants and take them out of the system. What tannins do is they bind to the protein in plants and make them indigestible. So plants are already low in protein. If you have tannins, it makes it even oh, worse. Right, right. Okay, so like on the left would be like deer and little nibblers. Yep. Versus on the right mm -hmm. where we might have sheep or you know kind and of, cows. And, and, but yeah, and, mm -hmm. and let's, for example, sheep and deer might be about the same size, but their mm -hmm. their their glands would look different. They should. And I think bighorn yeah. sheep are a good example. They have smaller. They'd be kind of an intermediate feeder, okay. and a deer would have larger. And I don't know about goats. I, I don't. Uh, no, yeah, goats are more browsers. I so think they, they have would those have large, their, yeah. They should. But but it, it makes sense. So when we go into class later on, and we sort of talk about how we, which animal we might use for targeted mm -hmm. grazing, right? We got to think about what's in the exactly. in the food, and then whether they have the capacity to deal exactly. with it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and, and if you think about tannins, if you've heard of tanning hides, of course. Oh. What yeah. you do when you tan hides, you put tannins on the the hide, and what it does is it binds to the protein, and it keeps things like fungus from rotting it because yeah. it's binding up and making it indigestible. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've talked about the digestive system, but we also should think about harvesting. And so when we look at the look at the head of uh, browser and grazers, they look different because we talked about how the shapes of those two different kinds of plants tend to be differ, different. So if you're trying to get little nutritious bites of leaves interspersed with spines or stem material, you need a long, thin muzzle. Mm -hmm. So they tend to, like this giraffe is a big animal, but has a long, thin thin face, very um, narrow incisor breadth. Um, when you compare it to a grazer, uh, which has a very wide muzzle and, um, and wide incisors, mm -hmm. I kind of think about like this way. If you were, your dad sent you to the backyard and said, I need you to cut down a bunch of shrubs, you wouldn't use a lawnmower. You would take a little loppers that are kind of yeah. narrow and you clip, 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 clip. If, if, if you were told to go mow the lawn or maybe mow a whole field, yeah. campus or something, you're going to get the widest lawn mower they make because it won't take you as long. So if you're a grazer, and especially if you're grazing on short grass, you need a really wide muzzle to eat, be able to eat it fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's oh, the difference. That's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. And we also see other differences like um, a browser having a wider mouth and prehensile lips to grab little bits and pieces. Um, they have, um, uh, the mouth has kind of cornified tissue to protect it from the sharp plants. Um, cornified as in uh, just kind of like thick and thick, tough. Like leathery. Kind yeah, of, yeah, kind of tough. Okay. And so um, the, the grazer is eating tougher grass a lot of times and sharp, so they have more cornified tissue. Um, the teeth are tougher in the grazer who's eating all that fiber, a lot of fiber. Um, and in the end, the browser eats more selectively, and that often gets a more high-quality food 
than the grazer. Yeah, that's Just a good less. comparison of the giraffe mm -hmm. versus the hippopotamus. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. pretty and you can think about domestic animal the same. You know, a goat has a small, narrow face. A, a cow has a very flat mm -hmm. face. Okay. Um, so again, we are showing the same picture as I did in the last lecture, but body size also interacts with those feeding strategies. So as we said, small animals have a high relative um, uh, metabolism relative to their size, and we said they need more energy per unit faster and per unit body weights. So again, they can speed up digestion by eating those high quality food, which tend to be browses, not always. Depends yeah, if you're eating mm -hmm. stems or leaves, yeah. mm -hmm. and passing it through the digestive system faster, which is that larger uh, orifice and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, they have a smaller mouth and a lower absolute energy, so they have more time to go picking around and choosing. If you're a large cow, you're going to be eating maybe 14 hours a day anyway. You ha can't be very selective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're going to be more general and you're going to hope to digest what you put in. Mm -hmm. So. so again, just sort of a review. We have those browsers or concentrate selectors. They can't tolerate as much fiber. So they're going to choose those uh, plants with lower, less cell wall. Um, they have a more rapid rate of fermentation because they're not fermenting all that cellulose. And they tend to feed, have smaller meals more frequently. Okay. And in general, they're, they tend to be smaller, such as this pronghorn. Again, the intermediate feeder or mixed feeder, we didn't talk a lot about them, but again, they're sort of in the, they kind of do yeah. a little bit of both. They can browse or graze. Um, they shift. They're good. Yeah, throughout this season, yep. they might shift depending on the forage. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as far as food goes, they tend to be the most adaptable. Oh, okay. Right. Um, they might have special, other special things they need, but generally speaking, um, they, uh, because they eat many different things, they might shift from something that's very high in fiber to very... Uh, low in fiber, different kinds of amounts of toxins. So they might have a more generalized diet. And again, they might be more intermediate in size. And then finally, the grazer or roughage feeder. I, we've been talking a lot about ruminants, but this pertains to other kinds of herbivores as well. They're gonna eat mostly grass and they need a large rumen or a large colon to process the forages to, to uh, ferment it. Um, and they, if they're ruminant, and again, I shouldn't have put the the horse on there, oh, but if they're ruined, a good example. they so have a cold, larger yeah. retention time mm -hmm. so that they can digest all of that cellulose um, that's in there, and um, they're often large bodied. So, in summary of kind of the last two lectures, your anatomy, your physiology, and your body size all interact together to really determine lots of things about you that are important what you can eat, what foods you can actually eat, therefore, where you can live, what habitats you can be in, what other species you can live with. If everybody's fighting for the same grass, that might be more difficult than if some are eating the brows and some are eating the grasses, such as maybe this fallow deer in with these cows. That's a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> or to find those kind of things. Um, and then how, in turn, they affect the plant community. So how how you affect the, the, gr the grass, the brows, um, other things like that. Right, okay, so that's really a take-home message. Things that a good rangeland manager, wildlife um, habitat biologist would know is sort of what's the right critter in, mm -hmm. in the right ecosystem. Uh, so this has a lot to do with wildlife habitat management. It also has a lot to do with multi-species grazing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and what kind of animals, uh, if you're going to do domestic livestock grazing, you got to get the right critter for the job. So exactly. understanding these basic principles is not just something to do well in trivial pursuit. <laughs> it's also really important if we're going to start managing habitats and create habitats that are viable for animals. Exactly. So I believe that is us. Uh, yeah, so thanks again, uh, Dr. Shipley, for joining me today. This is really fascinating. And again, I, I want to reemphasize that this is the foundation of what, how we can do management techniques later on. And certainly, you can't manage wildlife habitat uh, without understanding these principles because you need to know what animals need. And we, fortunately, with livestock, we can often change the animals. Yeah. Maybe the last point is we, you and I talked about sort of the, the standard uh, this is what it looks like. But there's a lot of adaptability mm -hmm. with an animal. So an mm -hmm. animal, like I was thinking about, we uh, met in Texas. Mm -hmm. And you were working on deer, and I was working on cows. Mm -hmm. And I could not believe that the cows could survive on that those shrubs in mm -hmm. Texas because they're not supposed to be able to eat them. But because they grew up on shrubs and they had learned how to use them, so because of their own life experiences, they, they, they um, were more adapted at it. So we gave you the rules of the thumb, you know, kind of the, mm -hmm. the general patterns, but uh, later on we'll talk about how within the lifetime of the animal those patterns could change. And then there's just, just to say, there are some really unique adaptations that herbivores have, such as caribou. Caribou eat a lot of lichens. They're very low in protein, 
very low in cell wall, and they've developed really cool ways to preserve that nitrogen in their bodies. So we even have some animals that have really special, unique adaptations yeah. mm -hmm. beyond what we've talked about here. So again, think about critters that you're interested in, uh, learn about their digestive systems, and it will come up again in class. And thanks so much for joining me today.